hello my name is Jason Newland this is relaxation hypnosis for stress anxiety and panic attacks please only listen to this when you can safely close your eyes I do have a new website for this podcast but I can't <laughs> can't remember the name of it which is terrible isn't it but hey um, it's it will be in the description or something Uh, it's weird because I've built I think four websites this week and it's the only one I I don't I keep forgetting the name of it it's stress I think it's stresshypnosis.com or something like that Um, which is quite unusual because it's actually become quite popular very quickly the the website's getting quite a bit of traffic for some reason so I'll have to sort of learn it I've got 11 websites so it's a I don't always remember all the different ones so thank you for for your support by listening to the uh, recordings that I make I haven't made one for about a week I think so I'm due a new one and uh, you know a new recording so what I thought recently I've been I've been working on uh, my I don't want to say positivity if things I've always had this negative image of positivity and it sounds like a really silly sentence when I say it out loud but um, when I was younger I used to hear people and some people would say you should just be positive and pretend and pretend to be in a good mood when you're not and as I've had bipolar for a long time I only got diagnosed uh, nine was it eight years ago but my moods weren't really dependent upon what was going on around me always you know in fact there weren't sometimes there were but you know uh, I could be at a wedding and be in a horrible mood uh, like a beautiful occasion so I used to get a little bit frustrated when I hear people say well just put a smile on your face and you know fake it till you make it and that kind of stuff and but recently I'm looking at it in a different way I say recently I mean over the last few years really um, probably over the last 20 years but you know more recent I'm 49 so I spent a lot of my life thinking it was silly but starting to look at it from different ways and you may think well what's this got to do with stress and anxiety and panic and um, a lot a real a lot and because there's a sentence I've got Andre on my bed he's my little boy ferret I'm going to walk into the living room with you I don't normally do this I normally try and keep everything really quiet in the background but I've got a piece of paper stuck underneath the television there's a television unit and it's basically taped to the unit in big letters and it says we become what we think about we become what we think about and 
that might seem like some kind of self-help statement that you would hear from a motivational speaker and that's exactly what it is and it's they're not my words this is uh, who was it Bob Proctor is where I got that sentence from that particular thing but it just the sentence enough that is not enough just those words is not enough it's digging deeper into what it means for us individually what it means for uh, reducing stress or the creation of those panicky thoughts so basically and it is very simple to say it I understand this it's very simple just to say something and it's really easy for me just to say uh, well if you do this this will happen but I'm not living your life I'm not living inside your body I'm not experiencing what you're experiencing and I admit that I admit that I don't know what it feels like to be you and that's a refreshing thing to hear somebody say it's usually the other way around the amount of times I've heard people say oh I know what you feel I know what you're going through I know what you feel I know what you feel like I know it. no you don't know how I feel because we're different people and I know that a lot of it is really well intentioned but we are different and I will never know what it feels like to be you you will never know what it feels like to be me and that's not a bad thing because we're all individuals but the idea is what we think about and I've mentioned this in the past what we think about affects our life it's just that particular sentence is mu a much better description than I give with one sentence you know, it takes me 50 minutes to, to kind of put what is said in that one sentence but for me that 50 minutes is needed because I think it's something that needs to be absorbed but also understood from the various different angles connected with reducing your stress connected with how you think what you expect to happen the things that you say to yourself, your internal dialogue, the things that maybe you've say, been saying to yourself for many years, the things that you think about. So I can't mind read you. I can't mind read what you think about. I can make a few guesses. I can talk about things that I've thought about in connection with anxiety, stress and panic. But this is also valid for all aspects of our life. Because what we spend time doing, what we spend time thinking about, what we spend time saying to others or to ourselves has an impact on us so I guess from this perspective I'm starting to think well how can this fit in with uh, looking towards recovery from stress from anxiety because even though it's different for everybody it's horrible for everybody 
Now that's uh, that word's an understatement, and it's it's horrific. Having extreme anxiety, panic attacks, it is this is a horrible thing. And I don't think anybody's going to be jumping up out of their chair saying, "Wait a minute, oh, I love it," because of course no one does. How could anyone? So there's that commonality. So I wonder, what do you do? Or what do you do in your life that you could change for you? Something that you could do differently that will improve the way that you think and by improve I mean change the balance of negativity and positivity to be in the positivity favour to be more positive top heavy positive without being fake without pretending and I'm not a big fan of pretending just for the simple fact that we have to pretend so much of our lives anyway you know if you go to work and you're in a foul mood and we're all allowed to be in moods we've all got emotions we're human beings you know if you're going through a difficult time at home why would you you know you're going to you're still going to have, you're a human being, you've got feelings. But you can't necessarily show them when you're at work. Or if you're going to school or college. Or if you're a teacher, for example. Or if you're a doctor. Imagine if you're a doctor. And you've got, you're seeing 40 people or 50 people patients a day and they've all got you know well most people don't go to, to the doctors because they're feeling well do they so and that doctor's struggling but they can't you know they can't snap they're not a, they can't go in and be grumpy thankfully I mean that would be horrible for the patient wouldn't it so we all spend time Pretending, putting on a, like a, a fake smile at times, maybe even a fake sense of humour, or fake courage, or just courage, maybe. But when you're in your own mind, why be fake? There's, there's no one to lie to. You know, I can tell myself that I'm wearing a suit. I can say to you that I'm sitting here with a suit on, tie, bow tie, bowler hat. And you may believe that. You've got no reason not to. You've probably got no reason to care whether I'm telling the truth or not. But the fact is, why would I say that to myself? when I know that I'm just wearing some tracksuit bombs and a t-shirt what benefit would I get for pretending that I'm wearing a suit so there's that kind of sense of pushing away the reality so which sometimes perhaps we feel we need to do in a situation like work or school or maybe in front of your children or in front of your parents. There's that, maybe that sense of not wanting to upset anybody or not wanting to disrupt other people's enjoyment. But you know if you've got someone that's close to you, a parent, a child, especially like a parent if you're a young person 
or if you've got a, you know a relationship with somebody and you need someone to talk to then build that honest relationship where you can be honest because it took me years to realize that you can actually be in a really bad mood and talk about being in a really bad mood with somebody without being an arsehole to them. It is possible to be angry but have a conversation with someone and talk about that anger without being angry at them. It's possible to feel anxiety and to talk about it with someone without feeling anxious because it's a safe space because you're talking about something in a sense when you talk about something you're outside of it you're talking about it as if it's a thing as if you're kind of observing it you kind of stepped away from it so that anxiety, that panic, that stress, you stepped away from it and you're observing it. And that distance that you can have, just by that observing, that distance really means a lot. Now if you think about an electrical current you know, it could be the most powerful electrical current in the world. But once it's disconnected anywhere, any part of it stops touching the other part of the wire. Everything stops. It doesn't have the power anymore. And it's the same with thoughts. It's the same with emotions, that energy, stress, anxiety. Once you step back, and you disconnect just a little bit that's only got to be an inch disconnect you've got two batteries you disconnect those batteries put an inch between them they won't work whatever it is that's been operated won't work if they're not connected in the right way Just like if you've got a hose pipe, it's connected to the tap, maybe in the kitchen or you know, maybe outside toilet, and you're gonna just you know, hose the garden or the flowers at the bottom of the garden, and you've got that hose pipe and you're walking to the bottom of the garden, and as I remember years ago, when I was a kid, it used to come off the wall, it used to come off of the tap and the tap would just drip onto the floor or into the the basin or wherever it was you know the the sink and go down the plug hole and you can stand there for the next 100 years and your nothing's going to come out of the end of that hose until you connect it back and literally it can be, the end can be in the sink still but still nothing will come out because it hasn't got that pressure from the tap the water's not coming out just taking that little bit of a distance a few inches And then the power's gone. The, you know, it's like I got I got this. Um, I don't say it's a dodgy plug, but it's. Whenever I use a toaster, and I've got through two toasters in the last couple of years, and it works for a while, and then it seems to overload, and I put the toast in, and it flicks a switch, and darkness unless it's during the day then it doesn't it's still light but 
everything goes off the entire flat goes off all electricity goes and that one switch gets flicked and everything goes off and it's a bit like that with with anxiety and stress and panic and if you take one of the components out you take a you know make one of the wires a bit loose a little bit of dodgy wiring you know maybe disconnect one of those wires you take out that and it doesn't work anymore it doesn't it doesn't function the way that it used to function. I remember years ago when I was in the Sea Cadets, learned about building fires and uh, about fire safety as well, because we were learning about how to build fires, you know, to cook food and stuff while we were in the wilderness, but at the same time, how to put fires out. And I'll always remember this we had the triangle. The triangle for fire you had you had to have one you had to have all three and if one got taken out the fire would couldn't work it had to have all three of those things it had to have fuel it had to have oxygen and it had to have is it heat <laughs> I really should re remember this stuff. You take the fuel away, the fire's going to go out. Take the heat away, there's no fire. And take the oxygen away, there's no fire. So you've only got to take one of those away and it disconnects it. And it's a little bit like that with anxiety, stress, panic by the way we think when you think differently think differently it changes that it disrupts the process because that wiring in our mind you know, it's kind of, it's a well-trodden pathway because we've got used to it. We've got used to going from here to there quite quickly and it feels like it's automatic when actually, if instead of turning right, you turn left. Instead of thinking of green you think of blue instead of thinking of what's going to happen if this happens what's going to happen if that happens or well, maybe this will happen or maybe I won't feel that way what will happen if I feel okay What will happen if I go a different journey? I take a different, you know, go around a different, few different roads instead of the roads that I normally go down. What happens if I get the petrol from a different petrol station? What happens if you think differently, but purposely? And not just be on automatic, because there's only one way, only one reason to go on automatic, and that's when that automatic is you're happy with it. It's a reason why we have to have driving lessons. And you have driving lessons with a driving instructor, and they only allow you to go and have the driving test when they know that you're capable of driving safely and on your own. 
until you get to that point, you can't take the driving test. Or they won't put you forward for it. And until driving uh, examiner decides that you're capable of driving on your own safely, you won't get the driving license. But once you get the driving license, you're just sent along and you can, it's like you've got that skill and it's an automatic skill that you've got. It's a, you just go along and do it. But you've had to learn it. Some people learn quicker than others when it comes to driving. Some people love driving, some people don't. So when it comes to thinking, specific thinking, thinking about how you feel, how you expect to feel, how you want to feel, Noticing how, you know, noticing the things you say to yourself. Changing the things you say to yourself. Correcting yourself. But not in a harsh way, in a gentle way. In a way that you would with a small child that you cared for. Being gentle with yourself. And I know that it might seem a bit uh, all lovey-dovey and fluffy. The idea of, you know, being gentle with ourselves. But I can't think of anything more important than being gentle to be fair, being gentle with each other. Imagine what the world would be like if we were just a bit more gentle. But we can't control the world. We can't control reality and what goes on outside. We can't control other people. But we do have control over our thoughts. Not necessarily the ones that automatically arise but we can do something with that. You think yourself, think of yourself as a, as a tennis player. You've got these balls coming towards you. Just knock them back, knock them back, knock them back over the net. You don't want the ball. And you can imagine you're actually on the... I'm, I'm not a tennis player. So I'm, no, I'm not talking about this as a like an avid expert or lover of tennis. I just think it's quite a nice analogy because you think if you're playing tennis, the one thing you don't want is the ball. You don't want it. You want that ball away from you. And there's an area where that ball has to be knocked away and the only ball that's okay is if it's out if it's out of a certain area and it's okay but even then the amount of times you see uh, even the best tennis players going to still knock that ball back just in case it, you know it hits the line or it's just inside so the most important thing is to get rid of that ball. So you think of that ball as thoughts. Not all thoughts. Some thoughts are beautiful. You know, if you're thinking about visiting somebody 
uh, that you care about, you think about what even something like watching a television program that you love watching, or uh, doing something that you enjoy doing. They're lovely thoughts. They're not. They're not balls to knock back. That's a ball to catch. You know, you want more of those balls knocked at you, knocked at you. But you know, you want to be able to catch as many of those balls as you can, and just embrace it. Embrace those nice feelings, because they are there. But when you see a crappy ball come in, and it can come in various different shapes, it can be a crappy thought, it can be, uh, it can even be something that someone wants you to do that you really don't feel comfortable doing, don't do it. Knock it back and knock that ball away. Or maybe you've got, you know, someone's got dietary issues. They may want to have the temptation of eating something that's going to make them ill. Crappy ball, knock it back. Or those thoughts saying, oh, don't do that because you're going to feel crappy and it's going to be hard. Knock that ball back. And there may be some balls you want to catch, just to examine. So you've got the ones you can catch, you know, the nice memories, the things you're looking forward to, you know, as far as these are thoughts. And you can catch them. In fact, you can catch them and just leave them on the floor. And they can stay there with you. And they can become part of the ground you walk on become part of you so those thoughts those really lovely feelings those relaxing sensations are always there with you within you for you to feel whenever you want and then sometimes as I said you get a ball that maybe you think well I don't know about this because you're not sure if it's real or not, if it's right or not. Might be true, might not be true. You might actually believe the thought. The thought might be, uh, the, you know, oh, I can't go to, can't go to a party I've been invited to because this will happen. I'll feel this particular way. And you might need to catch that ball and examine it and think well okay it's happened before I have felt I've had difficult times maybe at a, a family gathering but also I've had really good times as well and then you can look at the ball and I know it's, a, it's an old uh, not cliche but I don't know what the right word is but look at the ball and it's just an idea that's all it is in your mind all these thoughts it's just a thought and look at that ball is it made of stone is that ball made of stone and when you realise it's not you realise it's not actually a ball, it's just a thought. And thoughts are movable. Thoughts are not stuck. They only stick if we allow them to stick. But they're fluid. Always moving. Just like how we feel. We're changing. The way we feel is different. The way you feel now will be different to how you felt before you pressed the play button on this recording. The way I feel is different to how I felt before I sat on this bed with my little Andre on the bed over there asleep. Thankfully not making lots of noise. And 
it's okay and that's another thing I know I jump from subject to subject but this is a, a really important thing I think it's okay to feel it's okay to feel whatever it is you feel it's okay it's okay to feel angry sometimes it's okay to feel uh, that you're super sexy sometimes it's okay to feel um, really low it's okay to feel any feeling at all it's okay because it's just a feeling Because if I said to you that sometimes I feel like I'm really hot, I'm really like super attractive to women and you know I'm a proper catch and you might look at my picture and you think, hmm, a bit deluded possibly and uh, my thoughts don't really fit in with reality. Well, it's fun. It's fun to have thoughts like that. If you feel that way, you're going to be more attractive to somebody else because of the confidence. You know, it's a standard psychological thing. You probably feel happier in that moment. But in the same way, it's just a thought. So if I'm thinking another thought that oh I'm so ugly and no woman would ever look at me and I love to I don't know why I like to say this but I'd like to tell people that I'm becoming invisible to women and even though I say it as a joke it's not helping me and sometimes I put it in quite a, you know people will laugh and that but like it's not helpful it's not real it's not true either if I was invisible I could go shoplifting but I can't because they can see me so if we're going to criticise a super over exaggerated positive perspective about ourselves well surely shouldn't we also give the same the same attention, the same amount of judgment. I don't know if judgment's the right word, but maybe not take it too seriously. Maybe not take any feelings and thoughts too seriously. Because I know years, I keep talking about years ago, but when I first had the the stress, the, like the real, uh, like the panic attacks and stuff, and I had a, a period when I felt that I shouldn't be feeling this way. And I didn't want to feel anything and I tried to block off all feelings so that I could block off the unpleasant feelings which is something that a lot of people do whether anxious or not you know I can't be hurt I put the big bridge up so I can't be hurt the thing is if the bridge is up you can't be happy either you know, you can't experience, you have to have it open. You have to experience the rubbish as well as the nice stuff. What I discovered is, and it's not, it's not something that I've uh, created, it's just, uh, just a fact. I would say this is probably a fact, is when you drop that drawbridge, knock down that wall allow feelings to emerge and just allow them to be there don't cling on to them just notice them and if you're in a bad mood just 
that's how you're feeling. If you're feeling wonderful, that's how you're feeling. But when you allow the feelings to arise, they lose the strength. Just loses its strength to how it was before when you were trying to push it away. And it's, as I said, it's this kind of a standard theory within emotions and thinking and feeling. It's also really important, I think, to kind of remember that when it comes to the feelings, whether it's physical or emotional or whatever it is connected with anxiety, stress, panic, because by allowing those feelings to just be there it means that you're no longer powerless or you're never powerless but you don't you no longer feel powerless because that's the one thing about anxiety and stress it can be a sense of something's being done to you by an outside source something's causing this something's you know something's being done to you which it isn't having physical and emotional reactions to life and life's events and the way we think is the most natural thing in the world. Because you know, if you won the lottery, or someone gave you a hundred thousand pounds or dollars right now, I can pretty much guarantee that most people would have a really good day. I know that life isn't all about money, but that day would be all about money. That day would be a good day. Even if it was a case of, here's a hundred grand, you have to spend it today. You don't get to keep anything. You can just do whatever you want with a hundred grand. You can give it away, but you have to, at the end of the day, with no, no cash in your pocket, out of the hundred thousand and you don't have anything any physical goods left I suppose some people would go and have plastic surgery and stuff like that wouldn't they but imagine how much fun that would be everyone would have a great a great day whether you've given the money away to people whether you hired a helicopter or private jet to take you to New York decided to hire out up you know a pop star to sing in your living room for you and your family and so to give them ninety grand to do that and just to sing like one song It'd be a great day. And you may think, well, why am I talking about the lottery? Why is he talking about the lottery? And why is he talking about getting a hundred grand? What's that got to do with anything? It's got to do with feelings, emotions. Because you know there's times when in the past I have felt that there's no way I could have any pleasure like there's no way no way that I was ever going to feel anything but how I was feeling at that moment and I was always wrong always always wrong so whenever you think that the way you feel is never going to change 
you're wrong. And I don't think it's a great thing to tell people that they're wrong, generally. It's, in most terms, it would be classed as a negative thing. But in this situation, it's a positive thing. Whenever you tell yourself that you're less than what you could be, you're wrong. Whenever you tell yourself in your mind or think that things are always going to be the way they are now, you're wrong. They won't be. That's the same as eating a huge pizza, unbuttoning the top button on your trousers or jeans, sitting back in your chair and saying, that's it, I'm never eating again. You're wrong. You will eat again. Oh, I'm never going to feel hungry again. You're wrong. You will feel hungry again. Just perhaps not for a little while. You may say, yeah, but what's eating a huge pizza got to do with having chronic anxiety? It's about change. It's about realising that what's happening now is just now. And now is in this moment. doesn't mean in five minutes. It means right now now because guaranteed no matter how you're feeling right now if suddenly a helicopter a helicopter a helicopter landed in the road outside your house like safely landed a big helicopter and all the neighbours would be coming out looking and everyone would like be in the hallways you know and so what's going on and you know everyone would be in the street what's going on there why is there a big helicopter and then the president or the prime minister or you know someone really famous got out of the helicopter maybe um, Bono from U2 whatever whoever it is someone that you really like a celebrity that you really like got out of that helicopter the way you feel will change instantly and you may say well that's obvious it doesn't take a helicopter to change how you feel. Just walking into a different room. Moving your body. Thinking about something different. Observing how you feel. Noticing the things that you are thinking. Realizing that what you think about affects your life. What you think about now affects what you think about next. Affects what you think about next. And all those thoughts have an effect on how you feel, which then affect what you think about next. But instead of being like a big domino effect, you know those big long trail of dominoes all standing up, stacked together. You press one and they all fall down, and one by one. Well, thoughts aren't like that. They seem like that, but they're not. Because if you look for the angle, from a certain angle of uh, 
I've got, I've got no control and thoughts just happen and uh, that's, how it's, that's how it looks but when you actually look correctly you see that the gap between each domino is quite wide it's actually wider than each domino so that one gets knocked down it lands on the floor the one next to it is still standing up it has to be pushed over by you and that's the next thought and then you have to go and push the next one over so there is a gap between each domino instead of being automatic like we seem to think sometimes it seems like that it's actually not those dominoes are individually spaced too wide to knock each other down to have that domino effect so you're the one and I'm the one we're all the one that knocks the next domino over which means it gives you the opportunity to look at the domino do you want to knock it over or you just want to get rid of it maybe replace it with something else maybe you don't like the like it don't like perhaps you want to put a sort of add that one maybe you want something that's pink a pink domino maybe you want one with more dots on or less dots on maybe you want a little little one with a little hat on on top you know it can be silly do if you do it if you want it's your mind these are your dominoes these are your thoughts you don't have to knock the next domino down you can just get rid of it you can bypass it all together so that brings me to the end of this recording and I've talked for longer than I thought I was going to I thought it was going to be a 30 minute one but it's now 53 minutes so thank you for listening and I will speak to you next time and remember be gentle with yourself genuinely be gentle even if it sounds a bit goofy and a bit a bit like Ugh. might sound weird what do you mean be gentle you know what it means You know what it means to be gentle with a child. You know what it means to be gentle with a parent, with an elderly person. You know what it means to be gentle with someone you love and care about. You know what it feels to be gentle with a puppy or a little kitten. We all know what it means to be gentle. So it's time for you to be gentle with yourself from now onwards be gentle with yourself speak to you next time lots of love bye